Is it better to give than to receive? There's a decent amount of research showing the act of giving actually makes us feel better. My guest today, Lisa Maynard, has been giving, advocating, and devoting herself to the field of adoption, child welfare, and trauma-sensitive yoga therapy. In return, she has received a fulfilled heart and a satisfying career filled with noble engagement. I'm really excited to introduce you to her, so let's get started. Welcome to the Youthful Older Yogi Podcast. I'm MJ Waddell, your yogi host and founder of Share Yoga. I've been practicing, teaching, and loving yoga for over 25 years. I'm an advocate of movement, creativity, and staying healthy in mind and body after 50. And so are my guests. It's never too late to start, and there's a lot of healthy years ahead. So let's start now. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Youthful Older Yogi. I'm MJ Waddell, the creator and founder of Share Yoga, and you have found your way to the Youthful Older Yogi podcast. I'm so glad you're here with me today. I have a very special guest. Her name is Lisa Maynard. Lisa and I met up in Rochester when I was living in Rochester for a time being, and she is so um, multi talented and has so many titles and has a really, really interesting story that I thought um, would be great to share with the listeners. So Lisa spent 25 years in the field of adoption and child welfare, um, family attachment issues, so many trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive therapy and a yoga practice. She also has, I think for 25 or for, I'm not sure how long your own business, you can tell me this in a second, Lisa. Um, and I hope I'm saying this right, uh, Sati Virya which mm -hmm. stands for Enlightened Presence and Noble Engagement, which I love noble engagement. Those two words together just struck me. What a beautiful title um, for, for your site. And so she assists clients in examining their personal stories um, that might stand in way of potential growth, either personally or professionally or health or well-being. So thank you so much, Lisa, for being here and welcome to the Youthful Older Yogi podcast. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, MJ. It's my pleasure. Good. Yeah. Well, we're going to jump right in and I'd like you to tell our okay. listeners how you first found your way to yoga or how yoga found you. Oh, that is such a great question. And I remember that question from the very first uh, yoga teacher training um, that that I did. Uh, I found my way to yoga because I was looking for something a little different to do in terms of physical exercise. Um, and I uh, was doing weightlifting and, um, you know, Nautilus kinds of things. And I wanted to just uh, shake it up a little bit. And so I found my way to um, Breathe Studio in Rochester. and um, and I. I saw that the description was power vinyasa, the power yoga, the fast, let's move it, yoga. And I was like, okay, that's for me. Because I had tried yoga um, in other places where you kind of kind of sit and then move a little. And I was like, yeah, no, I can't. I just, I've got too much, too much energy. I need to keep it moving. Um, so power vinyasa was a really exciting for me in terms of the strength building, the chaturanga, right? All those, um, all the cool poses. And I decided to do the teacher training to get better at yoga. And then I did the teacher training and I was like, holy cow, there's no getting better at yoga. The yoga is the yoga, right? The pose isn't the yoga. I just love that. And the more I practiced, the more... I was like in a sort of in a Zen space, like in a meditative space. I was like, oh my goodness. My monkey mind started to quiet down. My body felt good. It still felt strong and, and able, but like all these other things just started to fall into place. And I just fell in love. I love it. And I, I ask all my listeners how they first came <clears throat> And usually it's really hard to explain to people what happens. You just have to experience yourself. And again, not, you know, you took some 
maybe gentler, you know, slower classes. But at that point in your life, you needed the ener energetic a type of vinyasa yoga flowing from pose to pose. So I always encourage people to just go to a, a, a myriad of different classes. And I'm telling you, you'll find what, what suits you. So that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I got to say, I, so I, I did that and I've done that and love that. And um, I did the 500 hour teacher training and we had a weekend of yin yoga and I was like, Oh, here we go again, all this slow stuff. Right. Um, <laughs> but I, I was like, Oh my gosh, you get down and you get deep and you get into it. And again, it's a different kind of yoga. It's a different kind of stillness. It's a different kind of stretching. And I now love yin yoga as well. So you're so right. You've got to like, give it a try different kinds of yoga. You never know what's going to appeal to you at what point in your life. You're right. And I think for yin yoga, for our listeners, yin is when you hold poses um, for you're on you're on the ground, you're not standing, you're on the ground and you're holding um, poses that are really your fascias, you know, being stretched. And anyway, it's not comfortable. But but what I found with yin yoga is that it's kind of a gateway into, like you said, stillness and meditation. And, and being there for, and you hold them for a couple minutes or so and being there when you really want to run away from it. <laughs> so I think yeah, it's a really good lesson in staying present, even when you might be uncomfortable. So yeah, Ian is awesome. Yeah. Is that what you teach? Yeah. And you teach I, that's what I'm, I'm teaching that right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, teaching meditation as well, but that, that, being present and also letting go. So letting go, like letting your muscles soften, letting your mind soften. Yeah, it's a it's a really great practice. And I think for all of the yoga practices, bringing that into everyday life is it's just life changing. Yeah, you don't have to sell me on it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I am. I've been sold for a few decades now. I wanted to pop in to thank you for listening to The Youthful Older Yogi. It's season two, and I'm so excited to bring you more great guests, education, and ways for you to stay youthful in mind and body after 50. If you love the show and want to help me make it even better, please consider becoming a supporter. You get to choose how much and how often you give, and there's no commitment. And remember, I donate a portion of every dollar I receive to charity. For 2024, I've chosen UNICEF. Just click the support button in the show notes. And just as helpful is sharing the show with other youthful older yogis. Thank you again so much for listening. And now let's get back to the podcast. One of your current projects, um, you're working on, a, I believe it's a free training for adoption support and collaboration with um, the Children's Bureau. So what drew you to um, advocating for adoption matters and family issues? Yeah, so I've been an implementation and training specialist for the Center for Adoption Support and Education for eight years, and I'm retiring, um, sort of semi-retiring. <laughs> um, hard to walk away from it. Um, we have a free training for mental health professionals and child welfare professionals that's funded by the Children's Bureau. What drew me to the work, and I've been doing this work um, since adopting my children. So my son um, came home to us. Uh, it'll be 37 years in September, and my daughter's been home for 35 years, and they're now 35 and 37, um, and uh, came home to us as babies from Korea, South Korea. And just sort of having an understanding that I didn't be I didn't give birth to these children, which I will tell you, MJ, um, still it's silly. But when I first held my son, I was like, oh, my gosh, he was born to somebody else. And it's so seems so silly now. And it seems silly then. It's like, duh, I didn't give birth. <laughs> you know, I didn't have that experience. But um, there's something bigger here that I need to be a part of and need to understand so that my kids can have the healthy um mental physical well-being is possible 
And so it kind of drew me in to that work. Um, oh. So I've been doing it for a very long time. I never, I never knew that about you. That's, that's, yeah. amazing. that's, and I'm sure your, your children are, you know, I don't know. I'm not a parent. I'm, I don't have children. Uh, so I've never had that experience of childbirth or having a child. I think we are all mothers, regardless of whether yes. we had children, you know, naturally or adopted, all of us are mothers. So I, I just love that that's what started you into the, into the field was your own experience with adoption. Yeah. Great. And yeah. you're also certified in trauma sensitive yoga. So how does teaching trauma sensitive yoga uh, differ from a, say a general public yoga class? Yeah. So I did the um, training through the trauma um, center at the um, justice resource Institute in Boston. And um, because I work in adoption and child welfare Trauma is a great big topic in that because a lot of the, the kiddos who are um, adopted, um, actually all of the children who are adopted come with loss. It comes with, right, losing your birth family, losing your birth culture. Mm -hmm. And um, wanted to just, you know, uh, increase my toolbox. And so the training is very much about choice making. Uh, interoception, what am I feeling in my body in this moment? Um, uh, having a shared authentic experience, like I'm feeling this in my body and I'm, you know, we might be curious together about what you're feeling. So it's a, it's a, it's a different way of teaching yoga. And as I started to teach, um, you know, some people were questioning me like, look, keep saying the same thing over and over. And, and it's true because in trauma center, trauma sensitive yoga, which um, actually has been um, approved by the California Clearinghouse as a, uh, an adjunctive intervention, um, evidence-based intervention, which is pretty darn cool. Um, but the, um, every single cue starts with when you're ready, if you like, you have a choice. And in a, in a sort of a, general um, yoga class, right? You're saying um, upward dog, downward dog, you know, warrior one, warrior two, you know, pl plant your feet. Um, you're going to feel this in your quads. You're going to feel this in your glutes. And in trauma center, trauma sensitive yoga, it's like you might experience some feeling in your body and you might not. You, you know, you might have a sensation in your shoulder when you lift your arm and you might not. You might have a completely different experience, or you might not feel anything at all. And so, all of that over and over again, when you're ready, if you like, you, you might choose to raise your arms up in the air, or you might to keep, choose to keep your arms by your side. Mm -hmm. So, it's very much, it's very different. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds, and it's, I will tell you that having been trained, um, in, you know, in a vinyasa style and um, the Baptiste style, and then to switch over to every time I say a cue, when you're ready, if you like, here's a choice, was like really hard to learn. And um, we have to be recertified every year through the trauma center. And um, every time I do a, a video, I send my video in, I'm like, okay, well, in that cue, you missed it. Like, Dang, <laughs> it's hard to remember. <laughs> Wow, interesting. And so that you said in California, it's now accepted as part of intervention therapy. Is that correct? So it's the California Clearinghouse. It's a it's a national um, clearinghouse for um, evidence based interventions. Okay. So it's uh, it's across the the country, and it's sort of like it's one of the gold standards for evidence based interventions. So that was a really big deal for them to get that. Um, certification. And do you think it will spill over into other, is it a national thing or is it a, just a state thing in California? No, it's a national, it's national. The, the, the clearinghouse is a national um, mm -hmm. entity and um, the center has um, 
the uh, Center for Trauma Embodiment, I think is the official name. I'll, I'd have to look that up. I should know it off the top of my head. But um, there are trained um, trauma center, trauma sensitive uh, yoga teachers all over the world. Um, I was in, I think, the second cohort, and there were only a hundred of us, and now there's hundreds all over the country, oh. all over the world, all over the world. Um, so this is a recognized intervention. So you can, you know, you can use this in addition to therapy. And it's I, very useful. Yeah. Even as you're speaking of it, like it's also can be infused into a regular class. Literally. I think, I think it's, it's so much more about, well, you're giving the person they're in charge of their own agency, basically of right. and they get to make whatever choice instead of, us just being the do this, do that, do that, you know, and yeah. really learning what does my body feel here? And maybe this choice might be a better choice than what the teacher is saying. So I, I find yeah. it that's uh, really, really um, nice to hear. So, um, and so generally when you, do your students begin to notice a change with this type of teaching um, when they're reintegrated to their, I'm not saying reintegrated, but have a better understanding of their bodies and what's going on mm -hmm. inside. What kind of changes happen for them? Yeah. And, and actually what you're saying when you say reintegrated, that's exactly what has to happen, right? Because when a person experiences trauma, um, most often there's a dissociation from the trauma, from the body. And depending on the trauma and the traumatic experience, that dissociation can last for, you know, a split second. Imagine like, you know, think about when you are in a car accident or almost in a car accident, right? And it's like, oh, mm -hmm. oh, phew, I'm fine. But then later on, you, you go home and you're like, oh my gosh, I, I could have really been hurt in that, mm -hmm. right? Or if you were, what is that, what is that sense of yourself and your body? And so that reintegration is, it really is the the right terminology. How do we reintegrate mind, body, spirit into, um, into wholeness after we've experienced a traumatic event? Or, you know, for some people, complex trauma, numerous um, repeated uh, traumas. And, um, and so oftentimes, I've got clients who, and I do this trauma sensitive yoga as part of my therapy as well as in a, you know, in, in a yoga, um, strictly yoga setting. But oftentimes clients, you know, you say, okay, when you put your hand on your leg, what do you, what do you notice? And when you do it, like, okay, I can feel a sensation of the, you know, the fabric of my pants and I can feel the softness of my uh, thigh underneath my hand, and I can feel sort of a warmth coming from my leg. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, people who've experienced trauma don't feel anything at all. Like, yeah, I don't feel anything. Mm -hmm. I, well, and so it's the, like, how do I get back in touch with and back integrated into my own body? How do I bring it all back? And is it safe to do that? So interesting. And I, you know, full transparency here, everyone that's listening, I always send questions to my guests prior to that. And I'm, I've been thinking a lot about trauma because we've all been through trauma with the global pandemic. That's just a, a you know, very combined. We've all been through it. The whole world went through it. So, um, and now, you know, you can't turn on the TV without seeing something that just alarms your nervous system and it just, you know, mm. shooting or a death or some violence or the war, health, all of it, all of it. So, um, so do you think now that all some of this trauma sensitive teaching should be included in the 200 hour or 300 hour teacher training programs. Because now when people walk into a yoga studio, yoga has changed since the pandemic, I think. And mm -hmm. now they're just starting to come back into group forms. So 
now as a teacher, how do, how can we, or do you think it should be included more of this training in any of the any of the trainings? Yeah, I you know honestly when I after I took the training through the trauma center, I started thinking about we don't know who's in our classes. We don't know who's forget the pandemic, which you're absolutely right, and the news of the day, the breaking news, right? Breaking, 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 breaking news. Oh, and <laughs> it's always breaking. And, um, you know, no wonder we feel broken so yeah. often, <laughs> right? But even before that, people come into yoga studios having experienced trauma. Um, my specialty in my private practice is women who have experienced trauma, domestic violence, uh, sexual violence, um, uh, mental violence, you know, emotional violence, all of that. And a lot of them are like, from looking at them on the outside, you wouldn't suspect it. They're functional, hold down good jobs. Some are in leadership roles. Some are, you know, in service roles. It's like, you don't know by looking at somebody and to not have that understanding, um, could have an impact on the student in the class, right? And so I, you know, we learned in the training how to do some uh, adjustments in the yoga class, hands-on kind of stuff. Personally, I love adjustments. I love the hands-on, but I'm a touch person. <laughs> you know, that's my that's my go-to. That I love. You know, the the you know, turn your body this way and pressing down on uh, in a child's pose. I always love that. And not everybody wants to be touched. And, you know, there have been um, studios that will use a little signal, right? Like you have a little, um, a little, uh, um, maybe a slip of paper that says, you know, touch or no touch, and you turn it one way or the other. But that's intrusive. That can be embarrassing. And so what I've decided is when I'm teaching, I don't touch anybody. I don't touch anybody, um, even though I would love to. <laughs> I'm, I'm exactly the same. Since the pandemic, I've not done any hands-on. And I used to be a very, even using props and strap, you know, I teach people how to kind of assist themselves now, um, which right. you, but I don't touch anyone anymore for exactly the same reasons. But I love when I have an experienced teacher for them to help me you know, because, yes. you know, if we're experienced and we're on the same page, but again, you, you don't know, you don't know if they have a, have a, a past knee injury or so, shoulder injury or you're, you know, and they're like, you know, and you, you yeah. hear stories of people getting injured because of <clears throat> being, you know, the teacher trying to help them experience the pose or something. So my cueing mm -hmm. has had to get more specific and, and right. <laughs> I, you become a better teacher when you don't, oh, I can just, I can just help them feel it this way, but you don't know what they're feeling. You do right. no idea. You know what you feel in that pose, but you're not, you could never be in somebody's body or mind. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and it, the, the other thing is what, how do we make, how do we, how are we giving those cues, right? And I, a lot of the classes I've been in, um, they'll say, this is, you know, the again, the pose is not the yoga, the yoga is the yoga. So you don't have to do um, some specific thing. You don't have to be um, in flying crow, right? Okay, you don't want to get there. You can't get there. It doesn't matter. But the the reality is in most classes, like, I know I look around and see what other people are doing and am I doing this right? And so that constant reminder, when you're ready, if you like, you might choose to do this, I think is a really, um, it's an honoring kind of language. It's an invitational language, right? If you like, you can come on in and do, do this with me. I remember MJ, I was in one class, um, a vinyasa class, and the gentleman next to me um, I think he was an older gentleman, but probably we were the same age. Um, <laughs> every time he did a chaturanga, he went up into a handstand. And I was like, oh my gosh, how do we do that? Like, 
can I even do that? How is he going from Chaturanga into a handstand? I couldn't figure it out. I got totally thrown out of my yoga, right? Out of my routine, um, trying to figure out how he was doing it. And can I be like him? And it took me several, probably 15, 20 minutes to come back to, wait a minute, I've got to do my yoga. And after the class, I thanked him (laughs) and said, you just taught me a lesson. Now, I cannot be you. I've got to be me. And I think that's the, that's just a, the beauty of yoga. You know, do you, you do you. Yeah, I, I, I've been in classes where people, you know, they're just doing, and I've been, I'm a pretty advanced yogi. Now, as I'm leaning into my later years, I can't do a lot of the things I could do in my earlier years, but I always get inspired. And, but also I don't, the comparison thing, that's where the lessons that I've learned, the comparison is, is, will cripple you. And it's everywhere, not just in yoga, it's everywhere from social media to TV, everywhere, the comparison. And I think that's what's really, for many, many people, it just feels like, oh, I'm not enough. I don't, I'm not doing enough. I'm not fit enough. I don't have enough of the enough, enough, enough. You know, they're coming from scarcity. So I think in the yoga room, yes, you could, I love to look around and be inspired by people, but also sometimes Mm -hmm. I'll look and I'll say, I'll, I'll have a little bit of of grief because I used to be able to do that. (laughs) Oh, I remember when I could do that. (laughs) So yeah Yeah. right there's all these and that's what taking yoga off the mat is what you learn with with yourself and about yourself is what we take off the mat people if you don't do yoga they would say oh take your yoga off the mat it's like what do you mean I'm gonna go around doing warrior one and (laughs) all this no 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 it's like what you learn about yourself while you're while you're in your practice it's a very it's such a cool cool practice but I like that you yeah. shared that, that for 20 minutes you were taken out. And yeah, it's, it's, um, it's such a teaching practice. So thank you for it sharing. It is. Yeah. And yeah, then with is. all your counseling and your teaching and uh, your own practice, uh, what do you do for yourself? <laughs> Where do you like, do you, for your own practice and meditation, do you have your own practice and meditation? Because I know when I used to teach full time, I didn't, I didn't do, that's when I started to get resentful because I didn't have time to do my own practice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, for, um, so I teach meditation twice a week and I try to get to the online meditation classes when I'm not teaching every, every morning. It's the first thing I do in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a conversation about how you starting, you've been starting your morning. I am starting my morning with either the meditation class online or I listen to um, Insight Timer and I do a meditation before I get out of bed. Um, David G, who is my meditation teacher, he's a meditation guru. Um, uh, he had uh, he said RPM, rise, pee, meditate. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Rise, pee, meditate. RPM. Yes. So you do that every morning. I am um, before I even get out of bed, because once I'm out of bed, I'm like, my mind is going, my day is going, the dogs want something, the husband's looking for something, I check an email, if I, if I do the meditation before I even get out of bed, if I'm not doing an online um, meditation, if I'm doing an online meditation, they're live, and so I, um, I get dressed, (laughs) because I feel like that's appropriate. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but that is that helps me start my day in a in a positive way. I had been listening to the news every morning, you know, turn the TV on as soon as I get up, it's the news, and starting that day with agitation mm-hmm. because you, with all the breaking news, I don't know how you're not agitated, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever your perspective is on what's going on. It's just gets your nervous system all wired. So I start every day with, um, with the meditation. It's been really hard for me for the yoga practice because I've in my um, job with um, case, I've been traveling. Um, last year I, I traveled 150 days for work 
Um, and then in another four weeks for fun, um, I've done this year, I counted it up last night. I I've done 14 trips this year so far, mm-hmm. like by actually by June 1st. And so I'm so desperate for a routine because that it just, the routine feels so good. And, you know, it's like, okay, now I'm into a habit. That's a good habit. that feels good in my body. Um, the yoga, my husband will say, you haven't done yoga in a while, have you? <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's definitely. Because it is so all, all encompassing, right? Yes. Yes. And we, Lisa and I had this conversation right before we started to record. She asked how I was doing. And I said, I'm doing, I'm doing okay. And then I said, I, I started, uh, saying before I get up in the morning, before I get out of bed, today's going to be a good day, which I heard from a expert on Mel Robbins podcast. So, and then when you go to bed at night, you say, what went well today? Now, I, I also used to just turn on the news and I, I have so many different gigs. I'm kind of all over the place, but like this morning, I don't turn on the TV. I got up, I did about a 30 minute practice yesterday i'm blessed i live across the street from the beach so i went for a beach yeah. walk but it's it's some t- type of moving meditation some mornings mm-hmm. i have to get out the door and teach or whatever but i think i think it's really um so i don't have a set routine i have to i have to pencil it in not pencil ink, ink it in into my right. calendar ink and so when it's inked it's to me it's non-negotiable. So I have to hold myself accountable. And if I, I, I always say, if I promise to show up for somebody, I always will. Why won't I promise to show up for myself? So that's been a pretty good, uh, you know, thing for me not to feel guilty (laughs) because I don't feel guilty. I'll be like, oh my God, I failed. I failed myself. So. Yes. Right. You know, I had, um, I was working, um, years ago with a, a gentleman from a local college and we were working on a project together and we were trying to make an appointment. And, and I said, well, how about, I don't know, Thursday at one o'clock. And he said, I, I, I can't, I've got an appointment. I can't change. And he said, I'm going to be honest with you. I play basketball every Thursday at one o'clock and I'm not changing it. And I was like, wow, that is so cool. Like we could do that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you could put an appointment in for me. <laughs> Yep. That's what I do. Sometimes the appointment's only 20 minutes. Sometimes it's an hour. So it just depends, but it's, it's yeah. so, so important. So, yeah. and you know what, once your traveling stops, Lisa, you will find, and you're going into your quote unquote retirement, which really <laughs> you'll never retire. You'll just find some new things to do that you know, <laughs> bring you joy. Cause I am semi-retired and I have four different gigs. So it's like, you know, right. <laughs> exactly but they're all they're all gigs that I want to do that I'm I'm enjoying doing it's not like obligatory stuff that I have to do so and then you'll find your your practice will come back to you I know there's ebbs and flows in it and when you're not doing it I know we don't feel complete so I understand that completely um yeah and so when you are ready to slow down I don't even like to use the word retirement so yeah (laughs) What do you think you will transition towards uh, when you leave, you know, your 25 year career? Well, I'm, so I'm, I'm leaving a, a one full-time job and I, I still have a private therapy practice. And again, I integrate the yoga philosophy and the uh, trauma philosophy into that. And so I'm, I'm going to continue to do my private practice. Um, but I'm not going to increase my hours. How about that? So I was, I've been doing this, you know, doing private practice while I have a full-time job. So I'm not going to increase my hours. I want to focus on the things that are number one for me. And number one is relationship. I want to feed my, the relationships in my life, my friends, my mom, you know, my mom and dad, my, uh, my sisters. I want to feed those relationships I want to feed my plants. I want to get out in the garden. I want to get grounded because along with yoga, that's the other way that I ground myself, get my hands in the dirt, take my shoes off, get barefooted, get in the dirt. (laughs) I went for a pedicure and 
um, I had been gardening and I went in and I washed my feet and I thought I washed them really good. And I got there and she was like, you need to use a nail brush. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> that I've been gardening. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I have seen some pictures that on Facebook, and your gardening is gorgeous. Gorgeous. I'm working on it. Anyway. Oh my god! <laughs> and I know right now. What are we in June? End of June. So in upstate New York, everything I'm sure is in full full bloom and and green and lush and gorgeous and. That's yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Uh, here we yeah. just have sand, so but it's like I, my landlord's live above me, and and he is a very uh, avid gardener, and so there's some beautiful glumaria and things outside my my door, and it's just yeah, it's well, it's a tropical paradise I live in. So yeah, well, yeah. So you also have ocean nearby. I do. So, that's I yeah. yeah. And that's one thing I always knew. I worked in Florida years ago and I always knew I would end up back here because because of the ocean and the water and that type of yeah. being in in nature for me is just the that's my grounding. Just going yeah. for a walk and turning it off. And right now it's turtle nesting. So yesterday oh, I saw yeah. turtle tracks that kind of stuff like I start to weep I'm like oh yeah. my god the turtles are me and so <laughs> in August you'll see, you'll see the little I've, I've witnessed it. you see the little turtles you know making their way all the way up from the dunes all the way to the ocean half of them will die more than half but it's just yeah. it's amazing um grounding this is when you're like what problems do I have? These turtles. Have to, are you kidding me? <laughs> right, right. Real work. <laughs> like, so. Yeah, they're, they're like this big, and they've got to go like you know three football fields to get into the ocean. Get in the water, and then they have to swim. I think it's three miles out to this big place. If they make it, they they probably won't. They'll get get eaten or something. But the ones that make it are on this big kind of like that's where they grow for a whole year and then they start to go out and mate. It's, it's fascinating. I just, oh, cool. I'm a turtle. Yeah. Person. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're off on a tangent there. Let's, I'll bring it back. So I always ask everyone, what is your current favorite yoga pose right now? Hmm. <clears throat> or have, I, forgot, I forgot that was one of the questions. Um, that's okay. Or what, a, what was one in the past or what are you looking forward yeah. to? You know, I I love child's pose. I love the the ability to just like settle in. I love it when we start in child's pose and end in child's pose. Um, it just again it feels grounding, right? You've got your hands on the ground. I mean, like your whole body is connected. Yeah, it's like a turtle. All cozy in. <laughs> it's like a turtle. Yeah, you're yeah. So you're you're holding you're holding yourself. It's like a. a a baby so child's pose for those of you that don't know it it's it's you're on your you're on your knees and you're like kneeling and you're this completely if you watch a baby sleep how they sleep yeah. that's that's exactly um yeah child's pose is pretty pretty awesome and and then i asked this of all my guests you didn't get this question so it's okay Surprise you, question. Surprise bonus question, yes. So <laughs> typically the question is, um, knowing all you've learned and experienced in your life, what would you tell your younger self? But I like to switch it. And knowing all that you know now and all the wisdom you've acquired through all your life experience, what do you want to tell your future self? Uh, I love that question. Uh, just be. Just be, yeah. Just be. Yeah, it's um, and I ask this question because as we are older, youthful yogis, right? It's <clears throat> I don't know about you, Lisa, but aging has been kind of traumatic for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah, it is. It not so much now because I'm talking more about it, but you're you don't you don't know 
what's going to happen as you age. So there's a lot of uncertainty. You are um, watching physical changes that are pretty traumatic to me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, for sure. Body gets thicker or like, where did this come like, from? Like, what the heck? And now I have to like, oh my God, I have to, I have to shave, right? I, I, you know, all this stuff, like what is happening? Like, I don't like it. Whose body is this? Exactly. I look in the mirror and like, what? what? I know. I know. Mom, <laughs> is that you? <laughs> yes, yes. It's very, it's really um, a, an experience that now I'm embracing it. But I think, you know, have you noticed any um, drastic changes, not just physically, but any drastic mental uh, changes as you lean into your later years? Yeah, you know, I think that one advantage is just not giving a shit anymore. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Right? It's like somebody said something about, you know, about me. Okay. It's not, it's not about me. I'm just, you know, I'm. I, I, it's not about me. And you don't like me? Okay. That's, I'm not going to let that touch me. I feel like I finally got to a place that I wish I had gotten to when I was 13, right? Or 23, or even even 53, mm -hmm. honestly, right? That I can be secure in myself. And if somebody doesn't like me, if somebody doesn't like my opinion, it's okay. We don't have to share an opinion. You don't even have to like me. I, I don't really care. Yeah. I, I, wa I want the people that love me to feel loved back and loved and honored and cherished and the people who are outside of that circle i like people to like me i'm a people pleaser i'm a therapist for god's sakes yes. <laughs> i'm a social worker right <laughs> so i i like it when people like me but I, it's not necessary it's not necessary to my sense of myself anymore and it's just i, I got to say it makes me sad that it takes so freaking long to get there like what the heck no, what what a, it seems like it's just so much wasted energy that we had trying to please everybody else instead of ourselves. And that's where, you know, yeah. it's like learning how to please yourself and and do the things that you want to do and make that make you smile. And not you're right. Not giving a shit. So, <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, so not at anybody else's expense, but not at my expense either. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, so it's a, it's I don't. I don't like some of the physical changes and, you know, I, I have not attempted a handstand in quite some time. And I was just thinking about that the other day. Um, I had shoulder surgery. What, like things are falling apart. What, what's that about? Um, so I haven't attempted it since then. I was like, can, can I try it? Maybe I should try it, you know? And then I hear a little voice like really at your age. And I think, well, why not at my age? <laughs> Listen, yeah, I, I, I did a, uh, I loved headstands. Okay. Tripod mm -hmm. headstands, not the traditional. Mm -hmm. I like the tripod headstands. So I hadn't done one in such a long, long time. And the other day in my practice, I'm like, I'm just going to try a tripod headstand. I, and I did, I didn't put my legs up because I live alone. And I'm always thinking, what happens if I crash? <laughs> <laughs> like, I have one of those devices, like I've fallen and I can't get up. Like, so like you don't have the button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but I just, you know, I was just resting my my legs on my on the back of my triceps. I'm like, okay, awesome. So, and that's a headstand. You don't have to bridge your legs up. I'm standing on my head. So, yeah, yeah. Maybe when you get to try it, you just have a spotter there with you or something. You know. Or I'm going to try a tripod headstand when we're done here. Awesome. <laughs> You're inspiring me. <laughs> well, as if our lives aren't all already upside down, but sometimes <laughs> when I choose to go upside down, that's my, like, like try it if you choose to, if you want to. And I felt like, I feel like I need to go upside down today. So yeah. So really. you shift to your perspective and you shift your energy and yeah, I think it's a great tool. And the best thing is I got up and walked away with no injury. <laughs> no crash. <laughs>
<laughs> Somebody so, didn't find you four days later. <laughs> right. And that's what I'll say at the, at the end last night. I'm like, what went well today? Tripod headstand. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome Lisa, i am so um honored that you gave time and wisdom today to the podcast and we will have in the show notes links on how to find you you're up in the rochester yeah okay. so um and again just thank you from the bottom of my heart um for being on the podcast you're welcome thank you i you're really welcome. appreciate your energy and your time and your friendship, MJ. So great. Thank you, Lisa. Take care. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Thanks so much for listening. For more youthful and healthy information, subscribe on my website, shareyogawithmj.offeringtree.com and receive my monthly newsletters. Or if you know how to navigate social media, find me on Facebook slash Mary Jane Waddell. That's Jane with a Y, J-A-Y-N-E, and Instagram at Mary Jane Waddell. Remember, Jane with a Y. This podcast would not be possible without the help of my editor, Dan Jones, from Cocoa Beach Productions. You can find Dan at CocoaBeachWeb.com. And of course, thanks to my generous guests who share their time and youthful wisdom. Remember, the Youthful Older Yogi podcast is presented solely for educational, inspirational, and entertainment purposes. It is not intended as a substitute for a physician or other qualified professionals. Okay, yogis, stay well, stay youthful, and keep sharing yoga.